la revolución cubana siempre ha tenido en cuenta The Cuban Revolution has always viewed man in the widest possible sense, as a complete expression of what he is, one that recognizes and respects his beliefs, his abilities to affirm himself, and thus contribute to the society in which he lives. I wouldn't miss a single of our Comandante's speeches. For me, his speeches are better than any novel, any music, even that played by the best orchestras. All those Los Van Van and Oscar de Leons as nothing compared to our Comandante's speeches. I'm certain that he is fully aware of what is going on in the world and this country. We always read when we can. We keep ourselves informed about everything that is going on in the world. No problem. Have a look at our Comandante here. Film him so that he too appears in your film. On January 1st, 1959, Fidel Castro and the Revolutionary Council overthrew the military regime of Fulgencio Batista, perceived by many Cubans as a violent and cruel dictatorship. The Americans helped Batista by establishing many businesses on Cuba, foremost amongst them in the tourism industry, as well as by purchasing large quantities of Cuba's sugar export. This gave the Americans an advantage, something they conveniently exploited as a means of exerting influence over Batista's corrupt regime. Castro's success was thus celebrated as a great victory, believed to herald the beginnings of a new era of democracy and freedom, especially as Castro promised to restore the 1940 constitution, which guaranteed representation for all political forces in Cuban society. In 1959, and probably the two years that followed, were years of great enthusiasm. A time the country had waited for, hoped for, to see the end of Batista's dictatorship and the years of horrible violence. The people were eager to see the country recuperate and return to the path of democracy. There was a lot of corruption, although, that said, there were many people of good will who fought hard to improve conditions in this country. Those were years filled with fervor and enthusiasm that affected, I would say, practically 90% of the population. And then I joined the cause and became deeply involved in trying to improve the situation in our country. And then there was the passion that young people bring. And there was a strong belief that by revolutionary means we would resolve the problems, that violent means had to be used if we wanted to achieve our aims quickly. Over the next 18 months, Castro consolidates his power and seizes and nationalizes land and property. With the US-imposed military and trade embargo, Castro turns to America's Cold War enemy, who under Khrushchev eagerly buys Cuban sugar at above market prices, provides the military support, and offers international recognition so desperately sought by the new regime. It's as if the history of Cuba is marked by a strange curse. 
During the first four centuries of our existence, Cuba was attached to a foreign power. We were a colony of Spain. At the outset of the Republic in 1902, and throughout the subsequent 50 years, Cuba was undoubtedly exposed to American influence and its history was largely determined by the United States. In 1968, a horrible phantom showed itself, a curse that has always accompanied this country. Cuba once again had to submit to another country and practically became a colony of the Soviet Union. Economically, Cuba fared well up to 1959. Castro's victory marked the beginning of a long downward spiral. In 1959, Cuba belonged to the top group of developing countries in Latin America. It had an extraordinary industrial potential, an efficient telecommunications system and an efficient transport system. In 1959, there were about 300 big sugar refineries in the country. In recent years, we have heard how successive sugar stores have been closed down. The country has lost its fishing fleet, there is no mineral extraction. Today, the main source of foreign currency earnings is paradoxically the money sent by Cubans living abroad. These are the effects of, firstly, 50 years of revolution, and secondly, of Castro's regime. Castro became chief of state, head of government, first secretary of the Communist Party, and commander-in-chief of Cuba's armed forces. President Castro exercises control over all aspects of Cuban life through the Communist Party and its affiliated mass organizations, as well as through the government bureaucracy and state security apparatus. The Communist Party, the only legal political entity, the Ministry of the Interior, the principal organ of state security and totalitarian control. As soon as Fidel had power in his hands, he started to lay down a whole series of rules that were not only undemocratic, but in fact immediately allowed Fidel to take control, with a group of faithful followers prepared to support him unconditionally. And together they set about the destruction of all the country's institutions in order to guarantee him power. We thought of democracy, of liberty, that elections would follow. In the end, we would have a country based on the rule of law. But it was not to be so. All such plans had to be cancelled. And instead, to this day, we have a one-man dictatorship in which Fidel is the judge of all in our national life. They insist, in a perverse way, on calling, classifying this long period of 50 years, on calling it all a time of revolution. This verbal trap, as regards the meaning of revolution, leads the critical world, those in society who analyze, the outside world that studies this reality, to view it as if in inverted...